In this video, I'm going to discuss some of the uh, major adaptations of a few animal groups. We're going to see that I'm just going to try to broadly make sure you're aware of the different animal phyla. Uh, phylum is the, is the singular. Remember that that's the group under kingdom. So just kind of the major animal groups. I don't want you to worry about that for my course because eventually we're just going to focus on two major groups, arthropods and vertebrates, because those are, I want to argue those are the two major groups that really dominate land. And I want to talk about uh, how arthropods do that with one of their major adaptations. And then I eventually want to walk through, just like with plants, how vertebrates gradually transition to land and, and kind of spread further and further with additional adaptations. We're going to find that that discussion will kind of be continued in a second video. So first, just a really broad survey of different animal groups. I really don't want you to worry about writing these down or memorizing these, but I just want to give you a sense before we focus on just arthropods and vertebrates that there are lots of, of different types of animals besides those two. So there are certainly sponges, um, there are cnidarians, a group that includes things like jellyfish, anemones, coral, so lots of groups in the oceans. Um, lots of different types of worms, just worms themselves make up three different phyla within the animal kingdom. Um, earthworms being my favorite because I have a compost bin um, and they're really important in the history of land, but we're not really going to talk about them here. Mollusks include things like octopi and snails and squids and clams, um, echinoderms like sea stars and sea urchins. And then finally, the two groups that we're really going to focus on, arthropods. Um, arthropods themselves are probably the most dominant animal group. Um, that Sometimes that surprises students because we're not arthropods. Um, but it depends on how you measure success. But um, uh, just in terms of definitely the most uh, different types of species, the most different types of groups within the phylum. Um, you can also consider things like biomass. If you were to weigh all of the different animals, how, how much weight would, total would there be? Arthropods would definitely be the highest biomass. Um, just insects within the group alone have their own field of study because they're so diverse. Insects like ants and flies and bees, but then there are also lobsters, there are also arachnids like spiders, there are also millipedes and centipedes. Um, so just a tremendously successful group in evolutionary history. Um, and then the vertebrates. So really, um, the arthropods and everybody else I just covered are considered invertebrates. And just to make sure you're clear on the terminology here, um, a vertebrate means you have a spinal cord. So if you kind of feel your back and you feel that rigid um, kind of um, line, rod leading up your back, that's your spinal cord. Um, so things like frogs and lizards and um, penguins and wolves all have spinal cords along with us. We are vertebrates. Um, and, and all of the other animal groups are invertebrate groups. So in just means not. So you're not a vertebrate. Like an inaccessible area, for example, would be a, an area that you cannot access. Um, so an invertebrate group would be a group without a spinal cord. Now, as it turns out, that's not actually our phylum name. We're actually considered chordates, but I don't really want to worry about the distinction between chordates and vertebrates. Just about all of the vertebrates are chordates. Um, uh, so that's really the group I'm going to focus on. Okay, so let's focus on arthropods first. What is it about them that makes them so successful and really dominate everywhere and, and definitely all areas of land as well? It's really their exoskeleton. So again, using your root words here, exo means um, outer. They have an outer skeleton, really this kind of um, covering that completely covers their entire body like this lobster here. Um, so two aspects of the exoskeleton are especially helpful for land. Um, number one, it's got a waxy layer to it, and that waxy layer um, slows water loss from the cell, the watery cells inside to the dry air. So in that regard, it's kind of like the cuticle of plants, if you recall that. So all of us have to have some kind of barrier to make sure we don't dry out and dehydrate. Um, and then the second aspect that makes the exoskeleton so successful is just how protective it is. It's really like wearing a suit of armor for an organism. Um, for example, if you've ever tried to kill a cockroach um, by smacking it, uh, maybe it's, it's a little tougher than you think and it survives. That's probably due to its very protective exoskeleton. Um, other arthropods will kind of uh, modify just how thick this exoskeleton is. If you think of flying insects, then maybe they can't quite make it quite as thick. 
Um, but uh, a buoyant, uh, an animal that lives in buoyant water like a lobster can make it really thick um, for extra protection. Now there are some downsides to the exoskeleton. It's quite heavy can, um, if it covers the whole body, depending on how thick it is. Um, it might kind of restrict motion a bit more. Um, and then, especially if an, if an insect wants to grow, um, it can't grow past that suit of armor. And so actually arthropods are gonna have to completely shed that exoskeleton. This actually right here is an old um, part of this insect. This is actually a cicada. Um, that is um, climbing out of its old exoskeleton and then it's going to try to grow really quickly and then sort of secrete a new exoskeleton. That process of removing the old one's called molting. And the real problem with that is that um, until it rebuilds a new exoskeleton, it's kind of exposed and unsafe. And so a lot of arthropods aren't gonna grow very big as a result. Um, that's why you probably don't need to worry about some kind of like six foot ant um, that will ever attack you or anything like that. Uh, generally arthropods aren't gonna grow very big in their history um, because they don't wanna molt that many times to be able to grow to that size. Okay, so let's kind of switch to vertebrates then. Vertebrates are the major group that have endoskeletons, endo meaning inside skeleton. Um, that's going to give us somewhat less protection than an exoskeleton, though I still want to say, like, for example, the rib cage does a pretty good job protecting the organs inside. Um, but it does grow with the body, so that's going to enable vertebrates to at least possibly be quite a bit bigger in size than arthropods. And when we really um, think about the vertebrate history, um, there are lots of different vertebrate groups that we're not focusing on here. Um, so again, I'm really kind of just focusing on the story of the transition to land. There are other vertebrate groups that, that aren't really considered in this cladogram. But if we um, start with kind of a, a certain group of fish that still live in the ocean, we're gonna argue that those um, fish in particular um, um, some uh, um, ancestors uh, uh, might have split off and some of those um, early fish might have fashioned adaptations that enabled them to uh, move and survive on land. And so let's kind of start that history to finish this video. Let's talk about this body plan and maybe one other adaptation that got us started on land and then we'll um, discuss most of the rest of this cladogram um, in a second video. So. Um, the first thing that had to happen was that you needed to be able to move efficiently on land. And as it turns out, we have lots of evidence now to suggest that a certain group of bony fish were able to reposition their fins and sort of evolve this four limb body plan. Um, we're only seeing two here because it's kind of on its side. Um, so this four limb body plan with kind of one big bone, two bones, lots of bones, um, that really is has carried through to every land vertebrate still today, including us. And so um, they kind of got this basic um, uh, body plan to be able to move efficiently. And then the other thing that needed to happen is we need to be able to breathe. And so um, as it turns out, uh, bony fish have this interesting little air sac inside of them called a swim bladder that they use. They kind of can either fill it with air or deflate it to kind of rise or sink in the ocean that they swim in. Um, and that air sac actually was, uh, we think, the, the derivative of lungs that we now use on land in order to bring oxygen to our blood. So we were kind of able to, to repurpose uh, fins for the purpose of moving on land and repurpose this air sac for breathing on land. And we can kind of think about modern amphibians as having those adaptations and, and making us think about kind of the earliest vertebrates on land. So modern amphibians include frogs and salamanders. Salamanders are a little bit different from lizards. Um, and the big difference, if you ever catch one, is really notice how wet the skin looks compared to the dry scales of a lizard. And that's really important. Frogs are typically very wet too, um, and that gives us a reminder of where we find these guys. Amphibians are really only going to be found in places that are warm and wet, like the tropics. So why do they have to live in those places? Um, I really want to focus on why they have to be found in wet places in particular. 
Um, and amphibians are only going to be in wet places because that they have to be somewhere wet to reproduce. They actually go back to the watery environment, like a pond, in order to um, reproduce. Um, both the male and female frogs will go there, and um, the females will release eggs, just like their aquatic ancestors, and the males release their sperm. Um, these are actually cute little frog eggs that you might find in a pond if you go hunting. Um, but if you were to take those eggs out of the water and put them on the land, they would dry out very quickly and die. Um, so the eggs have to survive in a watery place. And actually, if you've ever seen frog eggs hatch or salamander eggs hatch, um, they actually, the tadpoles are sort of aquatic creatures at first. So the, the first half of their life is also sort of requires a watery environment. Um, and, and then they really change their whole body plan. They stop um, taking the, the oxygen out of water and they start breathing air. Um, so they really undergo this massive change, but even as an adult, they also still have to find wet places because they want to dip into the water to get their skin wet because they actually breathe through their skin as well as using their lungs. So lots of reasons that kind of restrict them, and in our future video, we're going to need to discuss how other organisms fashion adaptations that enable them to live in further places like dry places, cold places, and we'll discuss that in the next video.